here, and there's no humming in the background because hum. Yeah. Next thing you know, you're gonna be doing that commercial with the the, the horns and everything. All right. So everybody, hey, have it, how's it going? It's another thir Wednesday night, Thursday it, night. It's oh, a Wednesday. It's Wednesday. Humpity hump, hump day. Hump. Yep, Humping yep. something. <laughs> Yeah, Whiskey Wednesday. How about that? Yeah, like for that. those who can partake. Not encouraging any underage, anything you're not a lot, not hey, supposed to do. The car says twenty one. Bottoms yep. up. Yep, yep. All right, everybody. This I, well, Rye Guy. That is I, Rye Guy. The guy. How are you rye. doing? How are you doing today? I am good. Okay. Nothing much, nothing less. Just good. Just good. Just, oh, yeah. just happy go lucky. Happy go lucky. You know, work is work. Yeah, but work gets you work. from the uh, point A to point B, so a lot of stuff going on at work, but making it through. Oh, it seems to be how it is. It's been very quiet the last few weeks, uh, relatively speaking. Uh, at your job? Yeah, it's been simmering. Cool. It's simmering. I mean, we'll we'll kind of see what's going on. I know a lot of people are not. Are a lot of people are quiet? There's a lot of quiet. I mean, not saying that there's nothing going on. It's just there's a lot of quiet. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're we're just constantly busy. If I'm not moving from one training thing, I'm moving to something else, constantly doing something. Yeah, training, development, auditing, or other. Yeah. So. Oh man. All right. So I'm just kind of dragging right today. Uh, How was the long. weekend? Weekend was uh was long. Weekend was long. Um, went out and volunteered on the airsoft field on Saturday. They had another one of their major. Uh, events had a vendor out, and that was cool. The event was great. Um, I thought it's. I got lit up a few times. In fact, I still got a bruise. Got hit there. Yeah, I got a nasty bruise. That's that's a yeah. That's a hard hit. Yeah, that was. But the funny thing is, is I got hit. Okay. And I I would make eye contact with the people who'd hit me, and they'd be like, "Dude, I'm sorry." I'm sorry. I'm like, um, I think one time I was standing in the tree line and they only saw like my elbow. Yeah. And it's like, oh, and just light me up. And then they see me move and then they see the red vest and it's like, oh, sorry. So <laughs> sorry. like they, they see a moving target, just shoot. Yeah. And I'm a big guy. And it's like, and it's Her, like first ask questions later. And one guy was even like, well, all I saw was your profile. And I'm like, okay. You know what? I get it. I'm a big guy. I'm, I'm a big guy. Try, I'm becoming a smaller person. Some people will notice I am getting smaller, which is great. But obviously, I need to rethink some of my attire, some of my additional attire. So as I, I went out clothes shopping, I got a couple of big red shirts. I actually, went down two shirt sizes since That's the last time I bought shirts. So That's always good. That's always good. Feeling good. That kind of expense is worth. Doing yeah, so, so that I was know. nice. Is like it's like all some new clothes, two sizes smaller than the last time I bought clothes, which is great. And but they're red. They're they uh they're kind of they're red re the red uh speedwork shirts. So it's like it'll be great for the hot and the heat. Yeah. So and it'll be it should be a little easier for people to see. Oh, don't shoot the red person. Got it. And I'm sure somebody will make some jo some oh yeah jokes at some point, which you oh, know. Oh yeah. <laughs> Can't get away from 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 some of that marketing, but uh, Snap. and then Sunday was uh, did birthday party for family birthdays. My dad, uh, my dad and my uncle had their birthdays last week, and my stepsister. So it was it was good. We all got together. Every year we do the same meal for for that for the July birthdays. Um, Girl Scout. Chili or Girl Scout tacos. My stepsister would probably kill me if she if I pronounced it wrong, but it was Girl Scout tacos, which is basically like a chili taco Tex Mex kind of mix. Okay. And you That's eat different. it with like Doritos and Sun Chips. Homemade is homemade. Well, you know, and it's good. And the thing is, we've done that for years and years and years and years. It's like that's it's, we've had a one or two times where we didn't do it. Yeah. But that's pretty much. July birthdays, that's what we're eating. It's like, okay. It's, it's, it's kind of like terrible. Me. Well, I do the same routine. I just want to go to my favorite sushi place. Well, the nice thing is I got to see my, my uncle was there, so I got to chat with him a little bit. Um, but uh, And my dad got to regale us on his uh, trip to Ireland recently. 
There you go. Well, actually, it was pretty cool because they went to where they did the where they they went the town they stayed in for for their trip was the same town they shot the Quiet Man with John Wayne. Okay. Old so film, it, popular film. Well, hands down, one of my favorites, and it's one of the few John Wayne films I've actually watched. Okay. Because I like John Wayne. What what guy does not like John Wayne? Oh, yeah. you know, he has that. He's the quintessential guy. You yeah, he's the guy's guy Westerners. and all that, you know. But I liked Quiet Man because it was a role that wasn't that stereotypical John Wayne role. Like, oh, yes. You see him, he's the macho guy. He's the, he's the, he's the man's man. Yeah. And the Quiet Man, he's a different type of character. And I just thought it was really cool. Marina Hara in there. From the from, I I recognize her first from the Parent Trap with Haley Mills, which is another classic of cinema. Oh yes. So those were those were some ones I really enjoyed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, let's make sure John Wayne stays away. Well, you know, I just think of the Dennis Leary songs. He's not dead. He's frozen. Oh, just We've... Round it out, cowboy. <laughs> but um, they stayed there and and. So my dad brought over this uh, digital picture frame with all the photos from the trip, and okay. was kind of narrating it for the for those of us who didn't go, who didn't get who, and uh, yeah. you know, it was a nice way to let it roll through. So it's like <laughs> he spent quite a bit of time messing with those photos. Yeah, it's uh, traveling Ireland, Scotland is a bucket list. Definitely want to yeah. try that one day. I definitely wouldn't mind leaving the country again for a vacation. <laughs> vacation. Speaking of which, I've got one coming up in a couple of weeks. Yeah, you're heading to uh, Wisconsin. Yes. Going to go to Wisconsin. Uh, my grandmother is turning 90 this year. Okay. So the whole family is going to get together for that. That'll be great because I haven't seen a lot of them in, in a very, very long time. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, and then, of course, get through that and then of course this week is also discovery channel shark week oh so yeah so i'm like a... oh i'm gonna jump in and watch shark week and you know don't go to bed till like 11 p.m and then get back up that's at early <laughs> but then again i'm a night owl so you're a night owl so and an early bird which is a really bad combination so i'm going to enjoy the day that catches up with you and yes. no longer you're no longer one one, one or the day other. it'll catch up to me, but <laughs> keeping my diet simple and always exercising really factors in. Oh yeah, I mean I'm not complaining. It's been oh yeah. I haven't. It's hadn't hadn't had. It's definitely handling it much better than yes. I used to. It's just, and I'm looking forward to getting it getting better. But checking out, trying to watch all the shark shows and it's it's hard. Plus I'm doing <laughs> plus I'm doing some work in the studio. Or shop area got some shelving going to try and straighten things up make it a little easier to work around in there hopefully work toward decluttering it uh, so i spend a little time out there every day so it's just project 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 it's all i've been doing a lot of what i've been doing what about you me this weekend it wasn't a very uh crazy weekend well that's kind of a lie uh, my best friend's birthday party or round two birthday party was this weekend. It was the one that was held at our house and it was 90s theme. Oh. So everything that was nostalgic from the 90s was there and it was pretty awesome. Party started at five and ended whenever we decided to leave. <laughs> so there was a few drinks, a few good foods, a lot of great snacks. I did get uh, caught dancing to Hanson. Mbop. Just because of after you get a few drinks and you start thinking about your childhood, it just gets kicked in. Man, getting routed with the Spice Girls. Oh, Ooh. them middle school days. Wow. Uh, yeah. Um, I can think of some different music I was listening oh, no. to in the nineties. Oh, there's but... a. It was a. She, she put together a playlist of all of the major hits from the nineties. So that's every all the genres. So wow. when the songs came on, you know, you hear you hear certain songs and you just fall back. Mm-hmm. And especially when you start thinking about how far the 90s were back now, it's just kind of like, wow. It is this interesting. Like, you start hearing 90s music on the oldie stations that are in this area, you start feeling old yourself. Well, actually, kind of interesting, speaking of old stuff, and, and you, know, I, you know I'm a big sci-fi guy. Yes, you are. There was a, um, a little blurb I saw that uh, 
22 years ago, the first Stargate SG-1 premiered. See, that does make you feel old. A when little you, when you when you think about bit. When, when you can remember things from your past and you feel like it's yesterday and then you'd be like oh yeah that came out 25 years ago mm. or that came out 30 years ago it's like and you're like what, what? it's like it's like eight years ago the final harry potter movie you released and it's yeah. like oh good lord time oh, yeah. flies <laughs> it is it is um like just a just a side note with music uh, one of my favorite bands blink 182 and the mother state turned 20 I remember when I first got that album. Yeah, so but it makes you think. Some, and it, I don't know. I haven't listened to a lot of mod, quote unquote, modern music. So yeah, yeah. And I think I'm kind of at that point. I'm not worried about what's out now. Yeah. I I keep listening to what was out. I follow. Then. I follow the bands that I like and follow the music that, if it, you know, still consistent to today, I'll find bands that still play that music. Yeah, and then there's some things I just can't seem to get my hands on. With all the pre iTunes, there's music I don't understand. But hey, I'm not gonna not well, gonna when I hate was, on it. When I was in Arizona, I had uh, I went away. I went. I left my car in the parking lot and went to Phoenix for the weekend. Okay. Unbeknownst and my own stupidity, I left the car unlocked. <laughs> and I don't know. Yeah, I went to Phoenix for the weekend. Came back. It was dark. Didn't think of it. Next morning, I get out to get my car to go to work, and I noticed that the entire interior has been trashed. That is the amp not good. I installed. All my CDs I collected was gone. Oh yeah. So all of my '90s music that I invested CDs and got burned copies of, of music and stuff all gone. The faceplate on my radio gone. The amp and everything, I was just like, yeah, this sucks. And it's like, but again, I have to I have to accept responsibility. It was my own damn fault. You left it unlocked. I did. Left it unlocked in a sketchy part of town. Yeah. Yeah, everything got right. I've had issues like and that happen it was to a, me too. And so the I thing understand. is, it wasn't like some beat up old truck. It was a silver eclipse. That stands out. So Especially I was doing. I, I was in my sports car phase. Vroom vroom. <laughs> you know, everybody has that phase. So yeah, I kind of big neon. It's like yeah, and yeah, but there's some albums I cannot relocate. I've tried to find them on iTunes. They never got imported into iTunes. Yeah. So even video game soundtracks is like I finally got a copy of one of them when I got. Uh, the re-release of Killer Instinct because the <laughs> Killer, Killer Instinct does have a very fun the original soundtrack. the original soundtrack is absolutely hilarious. There are there are times when the soundtracks makes the games worthwhile. Oh yeah, it's like everything. Your music helps tell. Music is oh, yeah. essential to the story. Oh yeah, it is. Especially when you have those those films that time capsule music so well. But uh, so I'm gonna ask. Last several weeks, you've been coming here with smoothies. What's today's smoothie flavor? It's usually the same, um, just because during the summer, Tropical Smoothie does do a temporary smoothie during the summer called Watermelon Mojito, so that's the one I go after. But <laughs> most of the time, I'll, I'll get um, an Immune Blaster, or um, there's another one with strawberry that I usually get. I okay. usually, but since it's the summer... I always go with that watermelon heat because you got to get it while it lasts. Yeah, I mean, and it's probably a couple things. more weeks before it's gone. So that's fair. That's fair. Me, I'm just doing more of the uh, the the Mountain Dew in the cup. <laughs> oh yes, but yeah, smoothie. It's a it's a filler. Hey, it works, man. It works. Alrighty, so let's get into our uh, topics for the week. So first thing is, of course, we're going to go over latest movie review for you. So what what what, what did you go to the theater to see this last well, weekend? Well, this is what you would call an event weekend for cinephiles like me. Okay. Um, because one of the most popular or uh, one of the most popular director in the film industry, Quentin Tarantino, um, he releases a film every few years, and he's only released eight up until this point. So this weekend he released his ninth film. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Okay. Another period piece 
we got Brad Pitt, who's a Quentin Tarantino alum, and we have Leonardo DiCaprio, who's another Quentin Tarantino alum. So how many other Tarantino alums were in this? Oh, there was quite a few. Um, I'd rather keep that mum, because okay. it could spoil some things, but you yeah, will, uh, spoil. if you're a big fan of Tarantino films and you recognize, you know, people that do show up in his films, you will see them. They'll pop up either in important roles or just kind of sidestep, you know, in the background or, you know, side characters. But there's a lot that do show up. Okay. Yeah. So from what I understand, uh, just over the, it's just over here, say, this is this, this movie takes place in 1969, Hollywood. Yeah, this takes place in uh, what is considered the last golden age of cinema, because right about this time is when television started to hit its prime, and television started to become a mainstream. Okay. So it focuses on 1969, and it focuses on two characters, m- majority of the film, it focuses on two characters, Rick Dalton, played by Leonardo DiCaprio, and Cliff Booth, Brad Pitt, and um, Cliff Booth is... Uh, Rick Dalton's uh, stunt double. So he has been, he not only is he a stunt double, but they're really good friends. Yeah. So he's been with them for the long haul. And they're kind of in the latter days of their career. Like he's not, a, um, Dalton's not a lately man anymore, so he's mostly just playing the heel in a lot of, a lot of um, films or uh, TV shows. He's the villain. Okay. So what they call the heavy. So he just takes the hit and falls. And Cliff Booth is a struggling stunt double, but he just plays it off because he's chilling with his friend. So he's always there for him. Okay. So, what are what are some things you what are some things you like you liked about the film? Okay. The overall thing going into a Quentin Tarantino film, everything is driven by the script. The, mm-hmm. He's a write every film that he's done that he's directed, he's wrote or had a, a code you know co writer, but mostly yeah. it's his writing. Um, he has a he's won two Oscars for best original screenplay, and it's. Not for fault. It's actually because he's a really damn good writer. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was looking at his IMDb page, and he's got 29 different credits. Oh, yes. He's got a lot of writing credits. To be writing, and some of them were things I was a little surprised to see that he contributed to. Oh, yeah. He contributed to films from the 90s, uh, popular ones that people might know, like True Romance and From Dust Till Dawn. Those are some stuff. Uh, he's contributed to TV. You said he did an episode of... ER. ER, which I didn't even know. Yeah, he did um, an episode of ER. Did a couple other... He did uh, two episodes of uh, the original CSI. There's another nostalgic piece. Oh, yeah. He's a, he, he, he has writing credits all over the board. He's just very... Um, just a very good writer. It's very simple. He's just a very good writer. And the, the, the main crux of this film is the writing because of... The way I describe the film from beginning to end, it's like uh, a life, you know, a life in the day. There's not a real strong like story plot, you know, not a traditional act, you know, act one, act two, act three. It's very much you're following characters as they're living living their life in Hollywood during this time, and with that, the strength comes from the characters. So you get to see how the characters deal with everyday situation at this point in their life in Hollywood. Okay. But also, since it's taking place in 1969, it does factor in some other stuff that were happening in Hollywood with the uh, Charles Manson and his little posse of uh, followers. Yeah, there was a. I, I heard there. I saw some. Uh, yeah. I watched uh, IGN's review of it, which was very flattering. Oh yeah. And the 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 Manson stuff is going on, and this is one of those things. It's like as you said, it's yeah. a life in a day. This film takes place so three days. Yeah, it's Hollywood. like it's like three days, but the great thing about that how they encompassing you know uh, Rick Dalton and Cliff Booth, and then you have um, you know some other well known names, directors and um, actresses that show up here and there, and then you have the Charles Manson stuff that happens, and they all just kind of just happen alongside Rick Booth, or uh, uh, Rick Dalton, Cliff Booth, the story, so everything's just kind of going, and there's a lot, a lot of loose threads. But eventually they start to cross or come, cl- you know, come to a point where they will come to head. But before they get to that point, you get to see the f- relationship and the friendship between uh, Rick Dalton and Cliff Booth. And that's where the strength of the film is. It's between their interactions together or with others, their dialogue. And you can feel the emotions, the comedy, the tension whenever they're interacting with each other or interacting with others in the film. Well, I mean... the. DiCaprio and and Pitt, those are guys who've done a lot oh, yeah. of character yeah. driven they, roles. 
have a huge catalog of films in their own right. Yeah. So you know they can do anything from action to drama, you know. I've never really seen DiCaprio or Pitt do an action action. Um, he, well, the closest are the ones that come to mind when it comes to action or is Blood Diamond and Body of Lies. Okay. One was an action drama and one was a spy thriller. So. Okay. But it's fair. The, well, the 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 like you said the strength because they're strong actors they bring a lot to the roles they yeah, bring a lot of personalities yeah they bring a lot of personalities they bring a lot of layers but also you can see their flaws and their compatibility their their, their chemistry on screen is so on point nice and I, I I wouldn't put it past them getting acknowledged at some award shows because of how great they're on screen either together or in individual scenes that they have. All right. Now what are what, what did you uh what are some cons to the film? Some of the cons is is as strong as Quentin Tarantino is with his writing director directing that can also be a fault. It doesn't always shine it doesn't always become prevalent in his films. Most of the time the strengths override the weakness, but if you've watched all his films, you'll notice that he, it sometimes scenes will drag. Yeah. Sometimes there's a lot of focus on unnecessary items, and what can happen is is that when you focus so much on um, scenes and situations, it can lead to undeveloped plot threads. So things will happen, and then there'll be like big gaps between something happening and when it comes back, and you just kind of lose threads. So there's a lot of um, looseness that happens, but that's very typical of a Tarantino film because he doesn't direct in a very linear way. It's very unorthodox. So as much of, as it can drag at times, you really have to be into the writing to be able to kind of let those things go. I mean, you acknowledge that the flaws happen like that, and it can leave some drag times, but the journey is still there. Okay. So you, is, he keeps your focus on the central focus on whatever the point of the film is, and this is the two characters. Right. So. And once you get into the third act, that is where the film will either it, 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 it turns it turns upside down. It turns it's it's a Tarantino. It's film. a Tarantino. <laughs> Basically, the third act turns into what you what you've come to either enjoy from a Tarantino film, or you acknowledge that oh that's that's Tarantino stamp. Like it's the it's the tip it's the topping on the cake. Like what happens in the third act? I'm not going to talk about oh, yeah. what happens because it's a spoiler. No, but no, what happens no is. I thought it it catches you off guard, but it can either catch you off guard and be like that don't make any sense with the rest of the film, or it catches you off guard where it caps everything because it does. The third act brings everything together, so all the stuff that we're like, what does all this mean? It all comes together. Mm. So it does, and it does end in a way that's very poignant for the characters because it seems like they finally, even with what happens, they finally might have a shining light for something. Some closure. Some closure to their career in Hollywood, or closure to whatever they were, that to something else coming. Okay. So. So what do we what do we rate this one? Well, because of the strong writing and the strong characters, I gave it a four out of five. I think it's worth the full price. It is an amazing film. I don't know where it stacks on the the bar with all the nine films for me. I still have to think about that, but it is a very great, great you know Tarantino flick, and it is worth the full price. Okay. Four out of five. Well, that's good. Woo! Yeah. Now we're back. Um, memorable moments. The one thing Tarantino is known for is very strong moments in a lot of his films. Working my way back, I'm going to start from, you know current going back okay um one of my favorites of him's and one of the rare films to get that five out of five for me is Django Unchained there's a lot of memorable moments in that in that film from you know comedic to action pack but one of the most memorable scenes is when uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's character Calvin Candy brings out the skull of um brings out the skull and he has a monologue about subservient Subservitude, and he cuts a piece of the skull where he says, This is the reason why your people are slaves. And this is when he rats out J Jamie Foxx's character and why he's actually there. Mm. Which leads into another strong, memorable scene, which is the, the, the gunfight. Okay. So it's like back to back. And it complements both Quentin Tarantino's styles from strong writing with a monologue to crazy action scenes. Okay. Just blood everywhere. So. Django Unchained has that um, 
what is one what is one of yours working back working back yeah. um, I'll be honest I haven't watched okay. Django Unchained all yeah. the way through yeah. and I, it's, it's one of those things I know it's a good film I acknowledge yes. it's a good film yeah it's for me I can't seem to sit down to watch the whole thing okay. through I have an issue with things that strike me as overly corny Oh yeah, and there are there are moments in it. I I, I will give you that and, fact. And there that, are moments that tends to kind of, yeah. and it, this happens with everything. If it gets overly corny to me, I I disengage completely it's, because it's, it's like I, trying to suspend your individual yeah. individualism to enjoy the film. Sometimes things and Django and Chain had a few of those. It's just because it struck me as so bombastically over the top. For the time period, oh, yeah, it it it's has like, it, it has an intent that way, but I, Tarantino did that because of the stylings and the fictitious nature. Oh yeah, nature it's very it. stylized, yeah, so, very very stylized. But I totally get it. It's no difference with me with a uh, slapstick comedy. You can it, you have to dance that thread very lightly with me before it just goes too much overboard and it's just especially it modern slapstick. You look at some of the older stuff oh, like yeah. the classic Chevy Chase, yeah, the classic Martin slapstick Short, I can watch every day. You know Steve Martin, the classic guys. They they, they had some of this newer slapstick. It's just like really are you? Are yeah, you being, there's a is it where's the adult side of this humor there, or is it we're just catering to toilet humor? Yeah, it, there's a reliance too much on toilet humor, but I digress. Uh, yeah, we're digressing. Uh, we're, pull, we're pulling a Tarantino. We just yes. went completely yeah, in we an We are full directory. Tarantino mode right now. Let's go left field. <laughs> um, let's see. The well, last one I actually watched all the way through was the Kill Bill and Kill Bill Volume, volume 1 and Volume 2. And I like Volume 2 more than I like Volume 1. You know, I'm in the same boat with you. I like Volume 2 more than Volume 1. Um. Not- and it was that that moment with um, I can't his name is escaping me and this is bad preparation. Was it near the end? It's near. It's Bill. Yeah, Bill. The actor who played the played Bill. Um, his whole thing because you were led up the whole story this one way and then you meet him and it's completely left of what you were expecting. And so it's like, okay. Um, but that was that. That's one of those. This is that complete left field for that, and it actually kind of this. It kind of threw the whole story because you feel this whole vengeance kick, and then you get to the third act, you get to the climax, and it's like, wait, what? <laughs> Yeah, it turn it turns into about face, and you, it becomes more of a more of a character study of what it got her got her to do what she did to that point. Yeah. So, there's What's another a, one. Um, working working back. Um, let's go all the way back to Reservoir Dogs. It's uh, it's been a while since I've seen it, but there is that one scene that sticks in my head is when um what the heck is his name. I can't remember the character's name, but it was played by Michael Manson, and he starts dancing. He starts dancing with the guy that's like changed the chair, and then he cuts his ear off. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That person they were torturing. Oh yes. Yeah, I thought that was that's got that's definitely one of my favorites because I can remember most of the pacing of that. Oh, yeah. And you had the this group of people together. You had them doing their doing. They all it's. You can kind of tell, to, and this is funny because I just watched a video bit from Dark Knight, um, the whole bank bank robbery scene, where it's like the, the different people had their individual jobs. Yes. And since now we're talking about it, it's like it draws back parallels. Like, there's a lot of parallel. There's a lot of that same kind of. Yeah. You have this eclectic group of people together, that each had a job, and they each did their job. And then things went completely sideways, and but I liked it because he, the 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 pivot to the 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 Tarantino pivot, I'll, yes. I'll, I'll call it, wasn't as jarring in the early in in there versus Kill Bill Volume Two or because I've heard some of the the some of the Tarantino pivots in like 
in, in, in Django because I know not people who watched it all the way through. Oh yes, and it's like these pit. It's it did. It's, it, it seems like it was. I don't know if it was better back then because the writing was a little more solid. Because it feels like the newer stuff is like I wrote it. I it, or it's the maybe it's the curse of expectation. Yeah, he, he, he set he set his own bar high with Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction, and Jackie Brown. That when he got to the other films, uh, he did more exper- er, experimental, and yeah. that's because he's he already set the standard. He already set his standard where this is what I can do now. I'm gonna go off and do stuff. You know, have fun with his uh, writing style and dive into you know fictitious play with like Inglorious Bastards and stuff. So oh yeah. yeah. So now he, he's he's dabbled in many many different genres, so that's why it levels him with a lot of great moments. Um, he's got a lot of genres so. and a lot of just satire, yeah, interpretations yeah. of things. What makes every film unique or every film memorable, no matter how much you like or you know not like the film, is that there's always something. You something specific to that story. There's always some strong moment, strong character, um, like in Glorious Bastards. You can just pick and pry scene out of scene out of scene in Glorious Bastards. Everything from the beginning when Christoph Waltz character is in the house mm-hmm. and the 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 girl is hiding underneath and he's having a mo- having a monologue with the dad, or the bunker scene where the in- people are infiltrated and they're having conversation back, and then all of a sudden it turns into a gunfight. Or you can go all the way to the to the past the after the theater scene when they blow all the Nazis to smithereens and Brad Pitt's character carves the the swastika into Christopher Waltz's head after um, scalping the other guy's head off. Yeah, <laughs> he left a brand because basically at the end, um, Christoph Waltz's character he's the reason that they got Hitler in the movie. Uh-huh. Like he he gave away their location for amnesty and all this other stuff. But Brad Pitt's character, I guess his cap, or you know, higher up, told him bring him in, and everything. So he couldn't really do anything bad. So he's like, you know what? I'm just gonna leave a swastika on your head. He carved it right in his head so that nobody, he will never forget, you know, that he was a Nazi. There's no way he could remove that scar. So he seems a character that'd be perfect in the new Wolfenstein franchise. Yeah. Um. All right. Uh, let's see. I guess it's my turn on the next one. Um, yeah, I'm gonna go with the probably, probably hands down, the iconic Quentin Tarantino movie, Pulp Fiction. That is that is that is that, that is the th- bar. That is, I think that is probably the of his work that I have seen, and I've seen most of his work. Yeah, that one is great because, as we were talking about with what you were saying in one, in, in in your review. When he has a group of characters for a long period of time, he have these fringe elements that seem underdeveloped. Yeah. What I love mo- what I love about Pulp Fiction is you don't get that because each pocket story is fully fleshed out. It's, and it's fully fleshed there's out. There's no there's no real going in with okay, well, why is John Travolta in this scene wearing this outfit and in this other scene not the, the, but the individual story for that element or that chapter of the movie is like oh that explains it you don't you don't feel like there's a fr- there's a detail that's missed it's a, it's a very it's very strong it's very structured even though it's not um, directed linearly it's just very tight it's tight writing and character development and everything in each scene in that movie has a point yeah, has a point, no matter how out of order the film is. And I get, and I guess I can. Uh, you kind of lose that in the later ones, but that one is definitely because yeah. of the various. That's what a lot of people do when they go into Quentin Tarantino film. They always go back to Pulp Fiction, like they do the comparison, and whether that's fair or not, you know, he set the bar. He did. But the thing is, the one good thing is that. Quentin Tarantino, he's he was always said he's not going to try to recreate Pulp Fiction. He's going to just do his own own thing for whatever story he's doing next. It's and that focus. I, I can appreciate yeah. that as a creative yeah. person because he, it's so many people. Yeah. I, I got I think a lot of people in in that business and in several other industries that we all 
kind of uh, uh, orbit around is this worked. Yeah. Let me keep trying to reproduce this that worked, only I changed this element or that element. Him is like, all right, I made this movie. All right, I'm going to take on something completely different, and I'm going to make a movie with that. He, he very, aside from the actors who appear in each film, yeah, because I think that's probably one of the f- funnier things. It's almost the, uh, it's almost the Sam Raimi game. <laughs> um, but every Tarantino film, you have a group of actors that appear. Oh yes, in virtually every one at some point. Actors are one. It's like Tim Burton. Johnny Depp is always appearing somewhere in his movies, no matter if it's Ed Wood to Alice in Wonderland. It's Johnny Depp somewhere. <laughs> or the Ray, or the Sam Raimi thing, where every Sam Raimi film has Bruce Campbell. Somewhere. Yeah. He's appearing somewhere. He's somewhere. You have to look for him. But you get that. And the, even even uh, even other cult, I uh, use the term loosely, cult directors like, um, cult following directors like uh, Joss Whedon has a group of actors that will appear consistently in every film he works on. In every project he works on, this group of actors is there. And you almost like it's like you see them it's like okay <laughs> so but all right any other memorable moments of tarantino um i'm going through um through his catalog in my head um you can go to kill bill vaughn in one where uma there uma there thurman's character is fighting the scene fighting the crazy 88s that's a very memorable scene that was the uh japanese crew right yeah the one at the end in the club and he's yeah, yeah, taking yeah. them all out um, um, you have uh, the chess the chess match of who's who in Hateful Eight in the second half, trying to figure out who the killer is. Mm. So it's a little mixture of uh, mystery with the spaghetti western because there's a lot of uh, deaths that happen in there. Hmm. Okay. Um, like I said I have to watch that one. I'm, well, I keep trying some of the later ones. It's like this sounds really good to watch, but I just can't seem to sit down to watch it. <laughs> Oh yeah, you just gotta like you just gotta power through, but not like at a point where it's it's an endurance race. But all all no matter how strong overall films are, he has always had strong moments in the films. Okay. So there's always something in it that will keep you going. So if it starts to stray, there's always something that brings you back. And um, I think he found it. He found a really good balance with it. Just to go back to Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Not to spoil anything, but he has very strong moments, and there the one of the strong moments. It's not a spoiler, but there's a moment where um, uh, Brad Pitt's character uh, Cliff Booth comes in contact with uh, Charles Manson's crew. Mm-hmm. It's a very uh, interesting moment. It's an interesting, strong moment, and it exemplifies the epitome of how great a director and writer. Quentin Tarantino's movie uh, is when it comes to filmography. Yeah, and I, I have to, I have to say that that's probably one of those third rail topics a lot of people yeah. don't mess with. And yeah, you get in because that's you're getting real close to what re, what ha, what act what happened not in the film but actually happened in that area that ever, that kind of overshadowed oh, and yeah. affected the area. Yeah, he he dan- he dances that line really good. That's all I, I figured can say. he got his practice with that with uh, Inglorious Bastards because everybody dance, everybody messes with that one with oh, the yeah. whole concept of the Nazis in yeah. World War Two. Except he took a different route and pulled the plug and killed them all. So, <laughs> hey, a fictitious tales can also be fun. Yes, yes, they can. A lot of Hollywood have these concepts of how the world should work. And they go on record. They're 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 on record saying things that a lot of people just kind of raise their eyebrow for. Do you think any of those any of that affects the film and its success or whatnot? The way Hollywood can influence something, or specifically since we're talking about Quentin Tarantino, some of his previous comments in the media about uh, police and whatever have turned on. I know a few of my a few people I know that are really turned off where they've written off anything he has his 
hands in because they were so uh, offended by the by what he says. Um, I, I let his comments put aside because he's his own person. Of unless course. he unless he truly is saying something um, um, derogatory, but most of the time he's not. He's just commenting on the on a situation. Uh, from his perspective, yeah, he's very he's a very he's very blunt, but he's not offensive in a way. He just he just he's a matter of fact. Like this is how it is, or this is how I how I see it. But he doesn't really offend. Okay. So figure got to ask because I know I know some people they will not give any any attention to the, his work after previous public comments, and I think that's unfair. I, to, I know which public comments you're talking about, and it just I'm sure but, we I'm sure a lot yeah. of a lot of people who listen to this. But and, you got to it's it's you, you're take what happens in that kind of situation. People are taking they're taking it about face like after the the truth comes out. They just want to turn on somebody because they were a close friend for mm-hmm. a long time that they didn't know about this other half. Oh yeah, people have their secrets, but I I think but what I was getting at was regardless of what he says as an individual, yeah. he just happens to be someone that because of his success, yeah. people will clamor around to record what he says and and yeah. it gets out versus you know something you or I would say, but I think that I think. And while I don't take away from anybody to have their own opinion, I think it's unfair to the artist side to yeah. pretty much write off anything they come up with because oh, yeah. of how they can of how they did X, Y, and Z. Oh yeah. Because um, I know there's a lot of stories of that, especially people who, you know they made a comment or did something when they were younger, and then current media climate is let's drag up all your dirt to bring you down. Yeah, and it's like reached 13, 14 years back when you probably weren't the same person you are today. Well, you you can't be. Yeah. You cannot be. And to hold somebody account and to to attack someone for what they did when they were younger and less experienced than they are now. It's like people forget they make they make mistakes and they learn from them. What was that phrase? Don't glass houses. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Tap houses. Tap. <laughs> so just give me plastic. All right. So <laughs> we'll kind of get off that. I just Tarantino is it's, just it's one worth, of those people. I feel it's a Tarant- hot button. He's I a feel hot Tarantino button. polarizes people. It well, it depends on 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 the group you talk. Because if you dabble in most films, that that stuff doesn't come up. If you go beyond the film, people that aren't into the film community, they'll start to rattle the cages with stuff yeah. like that. But just to end on a high note, it will be interesting to see if uh, uh, QT's 10th film is actually going to be what has been rumored out there for a long time, which is Star Trek. See, i, I got to be leery on that one because I think... I, I, like the, I like the idea of him tackling Star Trek just because you know it'll be a unique spin. I think, I think I'm going to want to watch some of, his, some of the stuff he's done that's not the Nine. Yeah. And kind of go for and kind of. I say go back and watch True Romance if you have it in a while. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen that one actually. Any other movie news? Um, well, there's two big ones. What's that? Um, one is that our our good old uh, friendly uh, neighborhood lion passed a billion. This Lion week. King hit a billion yeah, already. Hit a billion. It's only been out what a week? Two weeks. Two weeks now. It's already barely over two weeks. Already crossed a billion. So, any 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 word of it failing? Yeah, that's not going to happen. I, is there anyone who's not surprised that it was going to rake in over a billion dollars? Uh, I don't. If anybody I mean, was surprised, talking, then they've been hiding under a rock. And as we've gone over at length, The Lion King is just one of those films that Disney made that just prints its own money. Yeah, you just say lion and everybody's running. Where is it? You know. Oh, we're gonna do another film about Simba. I'm there. Yeah, it's like out of all the well, I'm not gonna say uh, live action adaptation because Lion King is a CGI creation. But any <coughs> any of this current era of adaptations, the one that I knew that was going to strike gold fast was the Lion King. It's a very popular title. It's a very relevant title, and it's just when you hear certain things from from the original animated series, it just kicks you in a different mood. Oh yeah. Okay. So, but, and the other mo- interesting movie news is that 
uh, a very interesting trailer drop this week. What's that? For zombies. Oh, Zombieland 2 Double Tap. Yeah, Double Tap, my friend. So, have you ever watched the original? I have watched the original, and I have to say, not very memorable. Not very memorable. No. Well, I'm the opposite on that. It was a very, when it came out, it came out 10 years ago, so it's been 10 years, so 2009. It was at a time when it, the zombie craze was pretty high, but they were doing a lot of, sim, you know, typical things. And then here comes Zombieland, which puts a different spin on the genre of zombies by introducing a lot of different kind of comedic elements and a different kind of, uh, like, family di- commodity. Yeah, this is definitely, and, definitely a, okay... Well, what if, what if instead of all dark and deary post apocalyptic, it's just you know we're just treating this like hey yeah it, whatever yeah it is what it is we just gotta put our rule book together do whatever we, we do yeah. what we want so yeah it's 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 a film that was very unorthodox but it had a very I think a very strong cast very unique cast of mm. characters and the whole plot line of finding the Twinkie just made me chuckle the whole time I was watching it. I do remember that he was, it ended with him in a box of Twinkies. Yeah, that was the that whole was his whole obsession. Obsession was Twinkies. Post apocalyptic place find Twinkies. Um, and then Bill Murray in there. That that yeah, Bill Bill Murray was just. Those are the only real things I remember from that. Yeah, the, and the zombie, then we see in the second one, it's like, okay, all right, well, you know, it's been a few years. They're still in that world. Let's okay. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of pros and cons of returning back to a franchise after so long. There's a the pro is that it gets fans to revisit something that it, they found memorable back in the day. Oh, yeah, and, and I gotta say this is the, the, the when this came out ten years ago it was the beginning of Jesse Eisenberg's career. Oh yeah, because I believe like right around the same time, um, the Social Network came out, which pushed you know. That and his role as Luther, yeah. and his his stuff in the D, in comic book movies and yeah. other things, he's really done a lot. Woody Harrelson, it's, it's like it's it's Woody Harrelson, yeah. That that he was made for that role. Uh, <laughs> it's like yeah. Most of the roles where you see him, it's like I'm, he's pretty crazy and I'm psychotic, not, but he it works. I'm not surprised they cast him. I'm I'm really not. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, some of the other characters they've they've done other films since then too. So oh it's, yeah. Yeah, the whole come back after X amount of time and then seeing what kind of crazy shenanigans they get up to. Yeah, it's it's and another pro is is like they got the all four original cast back. The Which original director and original writer. So you know that the people that are coming back to do the movie know the movie, love the material and they want to do it cuz you're not going to bring that trifecta no, from, not to, after this yeah. amount of time. That's yeah. I doubt paychecks were, were a player in that. But yeah, the, but the thing is with the cons, when you've returned to a, a franchise after so long, it's not been in 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 the movie sphere or at least in social uh, social circles. Is that whatever niche was then ten twenty years ago might not be the same niche that is today. Good example: is Zoolander. Zoolander came out, and when it came out, it fit the era and the time that it was in. The sequel fell flat on its face. I think, and that's something that's indicative. I think indicative of, of many of that type of film that he does. Oh yes, because Ben Stiller's definitely got some some skill. He can it's write just, when he's given 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 the right material. So, but there are times it's like really. So yeah, like you can you can, if you don't bring the property bag within. A perfect zeitgeist of time and people, it's not going to work. No. no. Um, so when when people revisit titles in hopes of bringing it, you know, bringing something, they have to, you gotta know the material or want to do great for the material, but you gotta adapt it for what the era is too. Yeah. And at least the trailer shows like they they are progressing to a point. Yeah, and I think it's I think the other thing, and just based on the trailer, is they are just. Totally becoming self-aware. The whole and a whole another instance of the fourth wall break. Oh yeah, it, I love it when stories are self-aware, and they, that, it it makes it makes for the film like it's very it makes for the satire 
even strong because you're obvious what you're doing and you just like you know what let's because I mean tackle. there was that there was that ending there was a last those last few scenes of the trailer where it's like oh they've just become self aware yeah that is just just funny it's just like do you see what I'm seeing what, do you see what's happening <laughs> am I hallucinating well we got some stuff for some other so we'll do a quick little bit on some tech news and then we'll kind of move into our last discussion for the day uh let's see uh this day in history this is probably the best way i can appropriately name this um let's see the original game boy came out 30 years 30 years this week wow yeah so that was the that, the, that green screen and... yeah, you talk about being old here's an item that makes you think wow i remember i remember when i got my first Game Boy. I still have the original Game Boy. Whether it works or not, I haven't tried it. But I remember when I got my parents got me. That was the first gaming system I ever had. It was the Game Boy and Tetris. Do, 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 do. That song just. Oh yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, I had one. I had original Game Boy too. Um, I did a again Tetris. That was like yeah. the thing. But it was the they they had nailed. The whole mobile gaming. Yes, it, it it brought it brought to it brought the idea of you know putting games on the go, and it set a trend and built on built its own generation of gamers, and led to a lot of different kinds of games, innovations of games and its own device. And without the Game Boy, we probably would not have the Switch today. I don't think there'd be a lot of things in the whole mobile oh, yes. gaming sphere oh, yeah. if it wasn't for the Game Boy oh, yeah. being so prolific yeah. and just like it. Could, like you think back to a day, like everything seems you know very archaic, but because of the stuff that they did, like you can link Game Boys with cords and stuff and have multiplayer. Yeah, which led, which and all led the to a lot of accessories yeah, and you, you know the lights, this, the printer. Yeah, <laughs> this various green yes. flex textures and then of course other companies like sega's game gear and whatnot but the game gear d didn't yeah, yeah. take off as powerfully as the yeah. game boy did the game oh, yeah. boy was simple yeah it's simple it did what it did and it had a very strong catalog of games yeah a very no matter if it's gone for game boy game boy color advance I doubt, yeah, I doubt you'd have the polo the popularity of pokemon without yeah. game boy that was another th strong point not only did the game boy make me a gamer it also brought me made me a strong pokemon fan because i had the original one of the originals you know had pokemon blue my brother had red and then i got pokemon yellow yeah set the stage for my pokemon fandom for days <laughs> and years to come yeah so I think that's so. That's an interesting little tidbit. Um, some other stats we got here. Would you you want you to do the next one? Okay. Well, uh, it's been uh, reported over across the interwebs um, on sites like Gizmodo and Kotaku, but it's been reported that Sony has uh, shipped out a hundred million units of the PS4 through January uh, June thirtieth, twenty nineteen. And that's from launch till till June thirtieth. Yes, so um, it just it just sets the story straight that uh, the PS4 has uh, really dominated this generation of consoles. Yeah, I mean it is a pretty solid oh, yeah. solid build, and was that it's uh, it's fast. It, it hit this milestone faster than the PS2 or the Wii. Yes, it hit that hundred million mark faster than those two. So it might, in the end. Depending on when the PSL five comes out, it might become the highest selling console of all time. That's just a premonition. Well, they've kind of nailed the console, even yeah. and the games they get. It's like they have a lot of exclusives. That's what's their uh, Sony's Sony's bread and butter has always been from day one. Is their exclusives and their exclusives are not short games. Oh no, you have like God of War, uh, Spider Man. Um, the Last of Us, Uncharted. Yeah, these are uh, these are days and days. And not and not play. to mention all the all the plethora of RPGs that you can just. It's pretty name solid them. for a solo solo playing experience. And especially, it might gener bring in more fans because when they release the Final Fantasy VII remake, it's only coming to PS4. Yeah. 
It's not going to any other console. It's not coming ported to the but future console. But still, it's Sony's big thing is yeah. single player con single player. Action. They know how to develop that single player. So yeah, I'm still. On, I mean, I'd still like to get one. Probably never will, but I wouldn't mind getting. Wouldn't mind getting one. When are you can get mine one day once I move on. Well, then by that point, it'll be the PS5. What would be the point? Hey. I mean, I got a PS3 that's collecting dust over there. You can see it. It's dusty. Dust, dust. Actually, I don't even think the HDMI cable is plugged into it anymore. I haven't touched it in so long. <laughs> <laughs> hey, at least it's there. It's, it's there. It's there. It's there. All right, so our last thing we're going to talk about, we're going to go back to some tabletop gaming because we haven't talked about tabletop in a while. Oh, yeah. So uh, my friends and I, uh, the uh, latest incarnation of the Shadowrun game has come out 6th world 6th edition and several of my friends all decided to get the uh, beginner box which I have a copy here it's all sealed in cellophane it's been like that for a few weeks um, but uh, are you familiar with Shadowrun? I am familiar with the actual video game. I know there's one. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. There is a. It's a. It's a uh, top-down um, uh, game. A lot. It's a. Uh, it's kind of. It's a lot like XCOM. It's a lot like those strategy games um, where you have you you have X amount of spaces you can move a character per turn. It's a turn-based system. Um, that was a really good game. I, that was actually my first introduction to the. World of Shadowrun, and I played that game via Steam, oh, seven, eight, seven years ago, roughly. Um, I was actually kind of, I had uh, come down with um, a, uh, a breakout of shingles, which, if you're not aware, if you've ever had chicken box, if you had chicken pox as a kid, I have, you are a candidate for the shingles virus, and it's... Basically, it's kind of like a, a rash that breaks out, and this particular year, I was in such a dire strait, health-wise, stress-wise, and of course, I got chicken pox, not once, but twice when yes. I was a kid, so, you know, I just rolled those dice on that. Um, obviously, I was at home. What do you do when you're sick at home? You play video games, and I played this game, and start to finish... It's a D and D meets cyberpunk in a kind of a noir espionage type thing. Yes. And I have tried to play the tabletop version for years and years and years, and people kept telling me that it's a really hard game because unlike when you think of traditional tabletop games like like D and D and whatever, it's you start thinking the whole hack and slash and kill yeah. everything and be the epic hero and get that that finishing music when you're done. Dun, dun, dun. And, but with this, it's no. You're sneaking. You're avoiding conflict. You're or you're avoiding so stealth combat. This is all about hacking and stealth and corporate espionage. Big corporations control the world, and mm, you're gonna like steal I'm, from them because you're a street urchin. Sounds like I'm playing Deus Ex. Actually, a lot of that, a lot of your, a lot of your very, I would argue that a lot of your various uh, cyber, cyber noir or um, dystopian future things, are definitely elements in this. But this one, it's you have all of your D and D races, but now it's like cyber cybernetics and stuff. Sounds really interesting. So right here, since we're gonna go ahead and open that, and you can hear it. We're opening it. Ripping that plastic a little bit, each little bit. No, that's my plastic. Oh no, it's like definitely opening this up. We want to see what's up because I think my friends and I are going to start playing a game of this soon, and we're all got copies so we can all have the starter stuff. All right, let you open that up. Go ahead and oh, well. get the box open. Still in its sealed stuff. We got the box open. You got one. First thing, one more last chance. 
13th anniversary with this new rule set. Changes that will shake the sixth world. New edition is easier to play and learn than before. Rule system is built around gaming advantages and taking risks. And faster gameplay and conflict resolution. So, it's nice as a... It warns you. Oh, yeah. It's like, it's like, you are a knight standing up for injustice or a lone wolf too dangerous for polite company. Perhaps a mercenary just looking for a bank or piling in or an agent of chaos searching for a match to light. Or maybe, just maybe, you don't know how you react to until the blood is flowing and the bullets are flying. So, you, know, you can check that out. As a, as a writer, you can... Uh, probably appreciate various things so we have our documentation oh our prefab characters are uh, some prefab characters are their own little books you got books to guide yeah books like each characters. character sheet is a little book it's a lot of reading or at oh, least yeah, I mean, this is, details well, For yeah, sure. I mean, this is a starter set, kind of like the D&D &D starter set, where you have your prefab characters, and they're all laid out, so you can kind of get an idea of what a fully fresh character would look like, and how they would play, and some of that mindset for that character. It's like this first one is the Dwarf de dwarf Decker. Let's see if I remember right, the Decker class... It's kind of like your cyber hacker. Okay, we got a few more character books in here. Oh yeah, we have Rude, the Troll Street Samurai. We have Frostburn, the Orc Combat Mage. You, the Elf Covert Ops Specialist. It's very, like I said, it's very kind of noirish. From the artwork here, it's it's really cool. It's very dark and brooding, but it combines elements of oh, noir yeah. and sci-fi, which is pretty cool looking. Yeah, so if you're if you're a noir genre type thing, this will be interesting. Plus, then of course we got its modern tech. So we have our quick rules, and here's our event. We have our first adventure. I'll let you open that one up. First adventure. Look at these quick rules here. It's got uh, your introduction before the run, what to do with certain items, prepping for the game, running the game. Let's give you the scene, what you do in the scene. A couple scenes, scene one, scene two, scene three. Yeah, it's very episodic. Yes, that's what I'm looking at. It keeps everything structured. It's got your cast of characters, so what plays in every scene. Strengths and weaknesses are listed in here. Some more settings, some more extra stuff to set when you're in certain areas and buildings and whatnot. Seattle Metroplex. Yep, this is where this one takes place. A lot of them take place. I've seen a lot of them. It's like you'd think maybe like Chicago or something, but no, no, we're going to go to Seattle. Like, here's a map well, of the it's, Seattle um, Metroplex. It's very good. I always like it when something tackles something that isn't New York or L.A. Oh, That's yeah. That's why I've enjoyed playing Watch Dogs 2, because it's San Francisco, Bay Area, so it's a little bit different. A lot more, a lot of different history there. Yeah. But a nice full pull-out map. Oh, and then we have... Give us a set of dice and some cards. You got your cards. It's got your um, items you need for the game. Tools in the card. It's just a box set. Oh, everything's just stuff. Yeah, everything's just kind of stuff in there. Yeah. So I like that. It seems to be a new trend. Like a friend of mine got the uh, got a late got a later got a new version of the Warhammer tabletop and called Wrath and Glory. And inside there was various deck of decks of cards for. Um, Different uh, in different aspects. So instead, of looking up on the table for the table in a book for this, that, or the other, here's a rando deck of cards that you can just pull from the top card. What is that six sided die? Yes, it is. And the thing is, is uh, each from what I understand, this is with this system is 
um, higher numbers do you better than lower numbers. Okay. Um, or the other way around. But you can tell in the dice that, of course, ones have a skull, which obviously ones are always bad. But the higher numbers have... the There's a delineation between the first three numbers and the last... Yeah, they have different kind of um, pictures and assortments of things. Which I think is good, especially if it's like you're rolling and it's like quick reference. Oh, the I'm seeing these symbols. This is obviously good. <laughs> I was like, oh, I see this symbol. This one it doesn't look that good. Yeah. <laughs> I think I should just quit. There's all kinds of memes about people who roll natural ones. <laughs> it's like, I never get past the block. I'll just pay you for the jail. But, yeah, finally got to open that up. Looking forward to definitely reading that. This book, this box is really yes. pretty. Yeah, it's a very, uh, very, uh, very strong box for, for a game box of any kind. I just kind of love that opening. That picture on there, there's like, you got your samurai attacking what looks like a Tachikoma from Ghost in the Shell. Yeah, it, he's, <laughs> he's really, he's really saying, screw life, I'm going to go out a hero. Yeah, but, uh. I know it was short, sweet, but hey, we've been kind of ha- looking at this box for a few weeks, and it's like, we keep, we're going to open it, we're going to open it. And then, we've been staring at it. <laughs> now it but, finally got to open it. Hey, that's what happens. The week dictates the news. Yeah, always does. Anything to look forward to this weekend? Uh, well, Hobbs and Shaw drops this weekend. Oh, that's right. Edris Al- I'm actually I'm actually rooting for Edris Alba. Oh, yeah, you, you'll be joining me this time. Uh, yeah, I think I will. I think uh, I think I will join you and partake in the yeah. uh, AMC experience. Hopefully, it's a plane in Dolby Cinema, so you get to enjoy those sofas. Oh, great sofas! I like that. The recliner sofas. It still is a good experience. Well, well, I guess we'll see that, and I so uh, guess we'll definitely be talking Hobbs and Shaw and Fast and Furious. Oh, yeah. So yeah, well, August August is a new month. Um, All right. <laughs> so with that, thank you all for listening. Give us a like. Check us out on our social presences, which the probably cut that in here at this point or another. Alrighty. Have a good night, guys. Till next week. Later.